today to uh, talk about some of my research, especially that uh, a couple of my former students, uh, Alexis and Carter, were uh, somehow conned into coming today. Uh, and uh, what I want to do is lay out uh, some of how I'm thinking about sort of one question in particular, which is how the development of autonomous weapon systems or what I think sometimes, uh, uh, unfortunately, but like good branding, uh, get called killer robots in the sort of popular lexicon, how they could shape uh, strategic stability and influence a bunch of things that we tend to care about, like, like arms races between, uh, between countries. Um, all right, so I'm gonna start uh, with not really talking about autonomous weapon systems, but by talking about the Cuban Missile Crisis. And if you will recall your basic history of the Cuban Missile Crisis, we, the US imposes a naval blockade. The US discovers these nuclear missiles in Cuba and that the Soviets have put there and deploys a naval blockade where the idea is they want to stop the Soviets from shipping more missiles, supplies, et cetera, to uh, Cuba. And when people talk about the development employment deployment of autonomous weapon systems, and when they worry about it, and, and you will, uh, I think, hear in mo many points in this talk that uh, I'm not, a, I worry relatively less than some other people, and this will be the first example of that. And that we, we often worry a lot about how uh, how things like autonomous weapon systems would affect, uh, would affect stability. But imagine that instead of a bunch of U.S. Navy ships uh, you know, populated with, by U.S. military personnel enacting the naval blockade, instead it was a bunch, they were robotic ships, essentially autonomous weapon systems, naval ships that had no people on them, that were, were run by an algorithm and that received a very simple command from the President of the United States at the outbreak of the crisis that said, if the Soviets cross, if a Soviet ship tries to cross the picket line, fire away. Which is essentially the order that the, uh, that the Navy is given. And in that case, you know, in theory, if one believes a lot of research on international politics, one would imagine that would be really credible, right? Because in, in the real world case, the Soviets actually get a ship through and the Navy decides, in fact, not to fire. And uh, you know, the crisis is averted for you know, a, bunch of, a bunch of related reasons, but it's probably a good thing. Otherwise, we probably wouldn't, none of us would be here. The, in, the, in the fictional case that I'm laying out, the, uh, the killer robot naval ship uh, is ordered to fire away at the Soviets, and presumably that would be more credible, and then the Soviets wouldn't even approach the picket line. Except for two things. One is, how would you, if you were the United States, convince the Soviet Union that you had actually programmed your ships to do that. It's not like you would show them the software code. You could tell them, like, hey, we did this, but why would they believe you? Also, you might actually want some control over those ships. You might give them the order that they should you know, fire away if the Soviets cross the picket line. But you might want the ability, what if you change your mind? You might want the ability to call them back. You might want a, you know, a direct line of communication where you could reprogram them, even up to the last second if necessary. If that's true, they're not really autonomous because you maintain control. You, know, you, can, you can change the order at any time. And so I think the challenge in some of these spaces, I'm using this example to illustrate the fact that there are lots of issues that I'll go through in thinking about some of the strategic stability implications of, of war becoming increasingly autonomous. But some of them reflect issues that we've always had to deal with in war, and others uh, reflect issues that actually suggest reasons why countries in many cases might not want to actually make their weapons fully autonomous, because they want to sustain control over them, particularly in things like uh, crisis situations. Uh, I've been working on a lot of different things in this area, as Alan was uh, kind enough to uh, suggest, uh, including this one. And what I want to do today is go through basically five things before we have our, uh, our conversation. The first is how I think about, uh, for those of you, uh, for you, the FHI folks, a couple of slides here will be, uh, will be repetitive. How I think about what AI is, what lethal autonomous weapon systems actually uh, are. I then want to talk about, uh, in this context, what the logic of deploying uh, military weapons fueled by AI might look like. Discuss the risk of arms races that you've note that I've, I've put it in quotations, which probably suggests something about how I think about it. And then talk about the thing I'm most worried about, uh, which is the impact on crisis stability and you know, whether then arms control provides uh, a positive potential solution to some of the dilemmas that I'm going to uh, lay out. 
So to start with this question of what is artificial intelligence, if we imagine AI as essentially machines doing things that we used to require, we used to think requ required human intelligence, put aside the fact that we constantly redefine what constitutes artificial intelligence based on sort of where the next, uh, where the next horizon is, we can think about you know, algorithms as things that can uh, direct physical objects, sort of help as decision aids, uh, manage information. You have applications potentially in the cyber realm as well as in the, uh, in the kinetic world. But AI is a huge category. We're not talking about a nuclear weapon. We're not talking about a bomb or a plane or a tank or something very specific. I think instead this category is what we would consider a general purpose technology. Something more like electricity, or the internal combustion engine, uh, maybe the railroad, uh, depending on your sort of cup of tea in thinking historically. Uh, and, and obviously my mind has been in some of these 19th century technologies, which is why uh, sort of that's where, uh, that's where I'm going. But that's, a, again, a huge category. That is not an autonomous weapon system. An autonomous weapon system defined by at least sort of one source, uh, that being the US uh, Department of Defense, is that an autonomous weapon system is a weapon system once activated can select and engage targets without further intervention by a human operator. What does that mean? It means that the human turns on the system and the system's programmed to do a certain thing. And after the system's turned on, the system goes and does, in theory, the system goes and does the thing. And that thing includes deciding who to kill or deciding what target to hit. And then in theory, if things are going well for the US, actually hitting it. Um, a side note that the US doesn't actually deploy any of these. Um, but this is, to be clear, a little bit contentious at the margins in that there have been debates at the United Nations for the last like six some odd years, some of which I participated in, about autonomous weapon systems that revolve a lot around some of these definitional challenges. And what uh, is clear from a lot of those discussions is that everybody understands what an autonomous weapon system more or less isn't in general, like a, uh, a tank with a person in it who like points the turret and fires the gun, not an autonomous weapon system. Everybody understands that uh, essentially something like the Terminator is an autonomous weapon system, but where exactly you draw the line is actually uh, controversial. And I'll come back to that when I get, well, uh, when I talk about arms control. So why would you pursue autonomy or artificial intelligence and specifically think about something like, uh, something like an autonomous weapon system? You've got a couple of reasons that uh, I think are specific to AI in general, and then one in particular that I think militaries are thinking about a lot. The first is the advantage of speed. You want to be able to fight at machine speed and compete at machine speed. The second is uh, machines don't get angry. They don't get tired. Presumably, they would be more accurate than humans might be. The third, I think this is really important for a lot of militaries, is that militaries have to make choices about investing in labor, like people, or investing in capital, which is uh, stuff. And AI has an attraction here for lots of different militaries. If you're a, de if you're a democratic country that, is inter that it doesn't want your, invests a lot in your people and doesn't want your citizens sort of to die, and also if you're, when your citizens die, that might increase the chance that you're voted out of office, uh, something that helps protect you against that, uh, might be really attractive. If you're a more autocratic country, you don't trust your people in the first place. That's almost like the definition of being an autocracy, because if you did trust your people, then you probably wouldn't be an autocracy because your people would be more involved in your government. And for them, the attractions of automation are obvious. You don't trust your people. Things that let you centralize decision making uh, are really attractive. And then also suppose you're worried about you know, communication lines being, being hacked uh, adversaries breaking into them, the idea that you could send something on a mission, pre-programmed, it's able to learn and make choices via algorithm, you don't have to communicate it, uh, with it again, might be really helpful in some kinds of wars in particular. Downside is that uh, there's a lot of risk here. I mean, if you're, if you're imagining the Terminator, I mean, it's a terrible trope for thinking about this. Um, also, the Terminator is a really well-functioning robot in general. Terrible rules of engagement. Um, like definitely violates the law of war, but, uh, but, but actually like works the way it's supposed to, kind of in theory. Um, but you know, we're talking here generally about narrow AI systems. We're not talking about like super intelligent kinds of systems. And they're, you know, like, like AlphaGo, they're programmed to, do, uh, programmed to do one thing 
And if they're deployed outside the context that they're developed for, can be prone to uh, malfunctions or other kinds of uh, errors. You also have a variety of ways that the effectiveness of, alg of algorithmic systems can be uh, disrupted. You can have biased data if the training data you use to train an algorithm isn't, uh, isn't, doesn't actually reflect the environment where you deploy the system. The, the system will be inappropriately uh, trained. Uh, an AI system could be hacked, potentially, if there's a communication line, or in like an old school black bag job kind of way. A system can be uh, spoofed. You know, think about the, you know, if you Google, um, you know, like fooling cat algorithms, you will find, you know, a bunch of articles about how, you know, these researchers designed an algorithm to be able to like tell what a cat is. And like these researchers figured out if you change like one half of one pixel on, uh, in that image, then the algorithm no longer says it's a cat, it says it's a truck. And one way to think about that is that kind of pixelation is what the camouflage of the 21st century essentially might look like. That a way that uh, militaries might try to defend against algorithms is by designing essentially um, like uniforms and equipment in a way to try to fool that kind of image recognition. You know, things can be deployed outside the deployment context, all the stuff that I just uh, mentioned. This can get really bad. In uh, we know at least in the financial context, if you think about the 2010 flash crash, you have automated trading algorithms that people aren't really sure exactly how they operate, interact with each other in unpredictable ways. What if you're, you know, the, the fear here, the risk is that you're talking about the flash crash in a military context, but now it's autonomous weapon systems malfunctioning. More risks too. That, that, that's because of us. Humans that, that delegate too much decision-making authority essentially that trust that these machines will be perfect even when they're not going to be perfect, making the humans more likely to deploy these systems out of context and have them malfunction. We have a bunch of examples from history of this already, even with very simple automated systems, including some uh, airplane crashes, as well as a, uh, an accident in particular using the US Patriot system in 2003. And I, I can talk about that in Q&A or something if people uh, want. All right. So that's in some ways like the big picture here. What does this look like specifically when thinking about these sort of areas? I actually think, uh, and this runs contra to what a lot of the, uh, some of the existing uh, uh, research as it were out there suggests, that uh, responsible militaries are in some ways going to include the risk of accidents into how they think about deploying autonomous systems. And this gets into the risk, uh, the issues surrounding trust. And that it's not just that militaries want the latest and greatest technology. That's true. But militaries also have trouble when it comes to military uh, officers often have trouble when it comes to trusting new technologies. They want technologies that are proven, that they know are reliable, over uh, technologies that, uh, that might have some upside but have, lots, have potential safety and reliability issues. Think about resistance, say, to the uh, use of the railroad in the 19th century. People you know, thought that the railroad cars would break down too often, better to march on foot. Like, that's nuts. But uh, delayed, essentially, investment and development of railroads uh, for in, in a couple of countries by uh, essentially 10 or 15 years. And what I think the, the implication here is that there's actually a logic of AI deployment restraint at times, where if since what militaries want most of all is for their weapon systems to do the things that they're supposed to do. And in academically, it's okay to talk about essentially like a dice roll, like this system like might work really well, but like it might malfunction. That generally doesn't pass muster in most responsible militaries. And what I think that this could lead to is actually a logic of deployment restraint in some cases by militaries who fear that their autonomous weapon systems might, you know, potential autonomous weapon systems will malfunction and so because of that conservatism bias, don't always want to deploy them uh, on the battlefield or you know, we'll insist on extra testing essentially to make sure that they'll work, uh, that they'll work well. The uh, problem is that that certainly will not apply to everybody. And part of this stems from a, a, a systemic thing, which is that if you imagine an autonomous weapon system is something that uh, in a given context. So imagine a swarm as opposed to an inhabited aircraft, something that might function better than the system you have now, but, but that's like a little more unpredictable. Sometimes uncertainty can be an asset. And that if you don't know exactly how it's going to work, your adversaries don't know either. 
And you might want to use that to try to, uh, to try to threaten them. Or if you don't actually care about your own people at all, then the notion of an autonomous system malfunctioning and say hurting some of your own people, like a frat fratricide kind of incident, is going to be less important than it would be to a military uh, like the United States, which then leaves essentially the problem is that this is going to encompass like a lot of countries uh, that where the like logic I discussed before might not necessarily apply. Uh, I think you know pictured here we have one of the sort of like ISIS jury rigged uh, drones, uh, non -state, violent non state actors. That logic of restraint probably wouldn't apply to. Uh, particular types of minor or middle powers, think like a North Korea, where uh, Kim certainly doesn't really care about the lives uh, of the like average, like the average North Korean is not like the priority of North Korea's leadership, uh, for sure. And the, so the idea of an accident that you know, kills some members of the North Korean military, but also gives them some upside against the United States might be really kind of attractive. Bigger problem is that is this last category, conventionally inferior major powers. So countries that worry about facing stronger militaries, that's basically everybody except for the United States. And that countries like China or Russia looking for a potential advantage against the human capital of the United States and its allies, then might find the prospect of automation really attractive, especially because they don't value labor as much as the United States does. Uh, as much as the United, as much as U.S. allies do, and so there's a logic then to not being as restrained, even though you might be aware that there's a, a higher parameter, essentially risk of uh, risk of accidents. This is magnified by these different types of AI uncertainty. I think, especially early in the period that we're in, so it's worth the outset of the era in which you know, we think that AI could shape the character of warfare. The there's a type of uncertainty we've been talking about up to this point, which is essentially. Does my weapon work the way that I think it's going to? Then there's the, from the perspective of the defender, there's that, and like, what is this actually programmed to do? There'll be a lot of uncertainty in early engagements using autonomous weapon systems about what's even possible among them. And then finally, there's the question of, you know, as war becomes more automated, how are populations, how will leadership respond to machines being destroyed? We have some early indications from looking at things like drone warfare that actually, look, if people don't die, governments are willing, the, are, are willing to do lots of things that they, that they otherwise wouldn't do. They're willing to like, deploy drones into another country. That drone can get shot down. They don't escalate the conflict the way they would if like, a pilot got shot down. Will that apply here? Or does eventually the, the, these systems become important enough that they can trigger sort of escalatory dynamics? That instead of being a, like a, a, a safe, like an extra rung in the escalation ladder, like now, they're, now it's an escalator. All right, what about this risk of AI arms races? Uh, this is a quote from the uh, Future of Life uh, initiative from several uh, years ago. This was, uh, uh, I think, a uh, part of a call signed by you know, thousands of people back in 2013. And part of the argument here was that you know, if anybody tries to develop AI weapons, a global arms race is, you know, global arms, whatever you can read, virtually inevitable is the point. Is that really true? Part of this, I think, gets to some conflation uh, when we think about this, about uh, we've lost, I think, an understanding of what an arms race actually is. And that if you think about an arms race as something that is one competitive, so it's directed against a specific other country, and two leads to massive increases in military spending relative to what you spent uh, what what you spent before, then I mean that's actually a very specific, and it has to be generally when we think about an arms race is in the area of a particular military system, like England and Germany competing over dreadnoughts prior to World War One or the US and the Soviet Union competing over intercontinental ballistic missiles, or, or, or any missiles, essentially, during the, uh, during the Cold War. There were specific things. But remember before that the, we were talking about how AI is so much bigger than that. AI is the combustion engine. AI is, the electri is electricity. What would an AI arms race then actually look like? I'll get back to that in a second. But I think the other issue here is we've forgotten uh, something actually written by uh, Sam Huntington uh, like 40 years before he wrote like Clash of Civilizations and some other uh, unfortunate things. 
and uh, that being uh, his work on arms races and the notion that it's important to differentiate between competition, proliferation, and an arms race. In that, you know, picture here is, a, is an Abrams tank, you know, main battle tank used by lots of Western militaries. We don't talk about tank arms races, even though once militaries started building tanks in World War I, everybody built them immediately. Everybody built tanks very rapidly over a three to four year period. We don't talk about the tank arms race. Why? Because the tank was a useful military technology that everybody thought they needed to sort of fight and win uh, World War I or, or you know, have a serious military in the aftermath. So everybody developed it. Instead, we talk about the proliferation of the tank. In that, uh, I think when you like, say, look at that Future of Life uh, uh, letter, some of the discussion about AI arms races, what's being conflated is essentially the risk that lots of people will want AI enhanced weapons because they're useful with the idea that that is inherently an arms race, which is not necessarily true. This is also related to the fact that I think that if you think about the category of AI again as this sort of broad enabler, that means that there, if to the extent there might be an AI arms race that happens, there won't be an AI arms race. There will be many different competitions in specific application areas. So something like lethal autonomy would probably even be too broad. It would be lethal autonomy applied to aircraft or lethal autonomy uh, maybe you know, applied to uh, underwater vehicles or, or sort of something like that. That would fit more traditionally how we think about sort of what an arms race is. Which is one reason why the sort of language, like this is pulled, this picture is pulled from a Financial Times article, I think, um, about, the, about the US and China. If you Google like US China arms race, you'll see like a huge spate of articles uh, come up about that. Why I think some of that discussion is misplaced, because what it's really talking about is both the US and China developing, uh, developing AI capabilities in a variety of different fields, in a variety of different ways, most of which actually are, are narrow artificial intelligence. Now, I think a key issue here would be a race for general artificial intelligence, which would be actually very dangerous under one particular, I think, situation, in that if inventing a thinking machine that could then figure out lots of other tasks to do and would be extremely power transformative, essentially, in its power relative to what came before, if that gave you a first mover advantage, such that you could lock out others striving to do the same thing, that would be really dangerous, because that means that there's really only one competition left, and that's the competition you need to win. But even in a race for EGI, as long as it doesn't have that property, then the, I mean, it, you could still end up with an arms race dynamic, but it's unlikely to be the last one. And traditionally, it's actually really hard to lock in first mover advantages uh, over time, because uh, generally, if somebody is close to a breakthrough in something, that means others are also relatively close to a breakthrough in something. And that is particularly true when we're talking about technologies whose underlying basis is driven by market forces, like AI, where the world leaders are companies, uh, not, uh, not governments. So then what about, uh, uh, this is actually what I worry about more, which is the effect on crisis stability. And the way that those conventional military applications of AI which I think are unlikely to be you know, discussed as arms races. You can think about this as anything from, you know, examples might include uh, things like computer vision algorithms that aid with sensing, uh, things like swarms that I already mentioned, uh, battlefield management algorithms that help organize the way human, humans and machines are operating on the battlefield. The uh, concern that I have is the way that, hopefully I persuaded you by this point, that if I'm illustrating concern, that means I'm actually, this is like actually a thing to be nervous about, is the way that that could place pressure on crisis stability, particularly in conflicts between uh, nuclear powers. And the reason goes back to that first advantage to artificial intelligence, why I pursued it in the first place. It's that machines make decisions faster than people and can operate faster than people. And that militaries want them because they want to be able to fight faster. And fighting faster, militaries think, means you can win faster, but it also means you can lose faster. And the fear of losing faster in a conflict could generate lots of perverse behavior, particularly by nuclear-armed countries. The risk would be that it leads to incentives 
for all of the worst sorts of nuclear doctrines we saw in the Cold War. Things like pre-delegation, where you basically say, all right, the war is starting. If you don't hear from me uh, every 10 minutes, like launch the ICBMs. Or launch on warning, which is like, all right, if it looks like, if our early warning radars detect an attack, you know, hit the button, fire back, like don't wait to check. That's super dangerous, terrible idea. But if you think that you might lose fast, if you think that you could be decapitated essentially uh, quickly, that creates incentives then to escalate faster yourself to avoid that potential outcome. And this is, I think, a, a crisis dynamic risk that, that I am concerned about. I think will be very difficult to deal with because uh, as I'm about to explain in this last section here, I'm not terribly optimistic about the prospects of arms control in this area, whether or not it is a good idea. And you, know, you have a, a, a large, actually, um, a large NGO campaign focused on the like, hey, why don't we just like, get rid of all this stuff before it, uh, it happens, which would be great. Uh, first challenge, though, goes back to that definitional issue I raised about 20 minutes ago, which is what exactly are you banning? To the US government, uh, you know, there's that definition of sort of selecting and engaging targets. But the British government, for example, has a totally different definition. The British government's definition of lethal autonomy is basically, in a nutshell, is if it's not the Terminator, it is not an autonomous weapon system. That it needs to be like a thinking robot on like par with humans, essentially, to, be, to constitute an autonomous weapon system. China's got its own definition. Switzerland's got its own definition, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So what exactly, you know, all of which would restrict different kinds of systems. Second problem goes back to this question of why arms races and, and arms competition happen in the first place. And often that's linked to security dilemmas and fear. Fear that if you don't invest in something, your adversaries will. And this is particularly true when we're talking about capabilities that countries think might actually be meaningful for delivering you know, capacity for them on the battlefield. And it's connected then to what I think is a huge challenge and, and hopefully one that people, uh, and this is one that hopefully there will be technical improvements to, uh, to tell, which is verification. When arms control has worked in the past, it has generally worked because you could count things. But how do you, if you think about the difference between an MQ-9 Reaper, like an advanced drone that the US military and a couple of other, the British military, a couple of others deploy, between that and say like an autonomous hunter killer version of a Reaper, that difference is software. Now it would take a lot of hardware to program that algorithm, take a lot of compute to do that, but and maybe, maybe that you could tell, although how you could tell what it exactly it was working on would be harder. But the difference between a remotely piloted Reaper and an autonomous Reaper fundamentally is uh, software rather than hardware. And militaries are generally or not traditionally very likely to let uh, other countries like plug into their systems and like read the software code, which would make, I think, verification extremely challenging, especially given the lack of trust here. And lack of trust is related to what I would call the, the arms control dilemma, which is essentially that the more useful technology is for war, you put aside nuclear weapons. I actually, the nuclear analogy is not terribly helpful here. Um, not that nuclear, nuclear weapons are hugely important, but like we tend to focus on them and then to the exclusion of lots of other things, that the, the more useful a technology is for sort of regular war, the more like a tank essentially it is, the harder it is to regulate because uh, lots of countries have interest in it. Lots of countries think it's useful for their security. Lots of countries have the capacity to build something like it, which then makes effective regulation, uh, I think, very difficult, which is why I think the best opportunities for easing ourselves out of some of these risks will probably involve Things like standard setting to promote uh, safety, uh, even though I think the, the, I might change the frame from safety to something else if you want to sell it to militaries, but that's a different, different story. Uh, things like confidence building measures, efforts to, to try to, at the margins, increase transparency. But a lot of this gets down to, at the end of the day, what you think autonomous weapon systems will be good for. If they're special niche systems that you would only use in the case of like, you know, like break glass in case of emergency, 
then there might be uh, actually some chance, I think a better chance at least, of, of arms control applications. But the more that AI, sort of like electricity, is going to be part of lots of different parts of modern militaries, some of which involve lethal autonomy and some of which don't, the harder it will be to regulate writ, writ large, which means successful efforts will likely include uh, focusing on very, very specific applications, like, like the truly terrible idea of uh, uninhabited platforms armed with nuclear weapons, like an autonomous system with a nuclear weapon on it. Terrible idea. Uh, that's something I, I hope everybody can get behind in, uh, in Bannock. Uh, but I think broader efforts at regulation uh, are going to be very uh, challenging. Uh, and with that, I will stop, and I, I look forward to the discussion and uh, questions. Thanks.